I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, available for pre-order now. And I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. If you want a discussion on the latest threats to our democracy and what to do about them, you can get that on this week's Gaslit Nation early show, available to Patreon subscribers at the truth teller level and higher. This week, we're focused on Putin's war and what to do about it. For that, we're joined today by two old friends and special guests, veteran and intelligence expert Malcolm Nance, the author of several best-selling books and the soon-to-be-released book on Trump's insurgency, aptly titled, They Want to Kill Americans, and journalist Sherelle Starr, host of the must-listen podcast, Black Diplomats, which decolonizes foreign policy by amplifying historically marginalized voices and much-needed perspectives of the crises the world faces. Here is where we are. Russia has over 150,000 troops surrounding Ukraine. Russia has blocked Ukraine's ports to run military exercises in the Sea of Azov in the Black Sea, which cuts off a key port in global trade, which amounts to economic warfare that violates several security treaties Russia has with Ukraine, including the Budapest Memorandum, for which Ukraine gave up the third largest supply of nuclear weapons at the time in exchange for security guarantees that Russia has flagrantly broken. Cyber attacks, bomb threats, disinformation warfare meant to destabilize and demoralize are all ongoing against Ukraine. Meanwhile, Putin has isolated himself, as represented by all the damn long tables he keeps using for meetings, like some shut-in eccentric. And he's mainly surrounded by just a few security chiefs and advisors. All of his generation laments the end of the Soviet Union and sees the world as a zero-sum game. The U.S. and several other nations have pulled their diplomatic staff out of Ukraine, shutting down much-needed development and security programs. The U.S. plans to open up an embassy in West Ukraine on the border of Poland and reportedly deliver defense aid to Ukraine from there should Russia escalate its invasion. Russia has claimed to have sent some troops home, but anyone who has followed Putin's aggression closely knows that this is just another trick up its sleeve to distract and try to catch people off guard. President Biden said today that the U.S. has seen no signs of Russia drawing down its troops, and instead they are continuing to get into formation for an attack position. Also, in Moscow, the Russian Duma, the puppet parliament controlled by Putin, voted on turning the Russian-occupied regions in Ukraine, which are Mad Max wastelands of Soviet-style human rights abuses, including a former art center in Donetsk, being turned into a sadistic terror like something my grandfather barely survived as a torture victim of Stalin's purges of the 1930s. That's what awaits anyone who falls under Russian occupation. It must also be noted that as the world looks to Ukraine, in Russia, Alexei Navalny faces a Soviet show trial on trumped-up charges. The anti-corruption reformer who exposed massive corruption by Putin and his oligarchs is being charged with corruption Because that's what the Trumps and the Putins of the world do. They gaslight. Navalny faces 10 more years in prison, and his supporters fear that Putin will escalate his invasion of Ukraine, use that opportunity of the world being distracted by finally killing Navalny. It's never been a more dangerous time for him, a man who ignited mass protests against Putin. Inside Russia, Putin's terror against his people has never been greater showing yet again what awaits Ukraine or anyone anywhere that finds themselves trapped under Russian occupation. Putin is bringing back the captured nations of Russian imperialism during the Soviet period. Today is February 15, 
anything can happen over the coming days. Yeah, so, Terrell, what do you think is going to happen this week? Okay, so thank you. First of all, you all are very dear friends of mine. So thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Uh, and greetings from the bees. And before I even get into any of that, I'm just going to show you with my wonderful escargot. Oh, my and, God. You know, because Andrea is, is she's married to a Frenchman, I'm doing this to make you even more jealous. But at any rate. Um, you guys suck so bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I did on purpose. But okay, so let's go back to your question. So what, what I think is going to happen is it's a wait and see situation. Ukraine is going to continue to be on high alert in regards from a military standpoint because you know I've seen reports of some Russian troops moving away from the border, uh, according to the Minister of Defense of Russia. But it's kind of a red herring. We really don't know exactly what that means because these type of tricks have happened before. And so it could be a tactic in order to trick Ukraine into thinking that in order for them to um, loosen their guard. And so this is a, a typical criminal trick. Uh, I don't believe it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of it. I hope that it comes to fruition that they are slowly withdrawing troops from the border. But is that a guarantee that they're going to make a complete withdrawal? We don't necessarily know. Also, what I predict, what, what, what I think will happen is that there will be continued pressure uh, behind closed doors with the criminals. Because I think that there are a number of things that are working that we should be very optimistic about. One, the fact that after meetings with German, with, with the German chancellor and with Macron, for example, of France, uh, there doesn't seem to be any hedging on their part in regards to Ukraine. Uh, there have not been any concessions about the future of Ukraine's membership to the EU, which is very promising. What's also very promising is that there doesn't seem to be, from our from from our perspective on the ground, any pressuring of Ukraine to concede to what Putin wants, which is to official recognition of the Luhansk and the Donbass regions uh, from the Kiev government. And so I see that everybody's going to continue to uh, dig their hills in, but everyone digging their hills in from the perspective of Ukraine and the West, uh, that seems to be prevailing at this point. And at the, you know, in regards to what will happen militarily, uh, I'll let Malcolm take on that perspective, but everything seems to be slightly promising, but with extreme caution. Um, Malcolm, what do you think is going to happen this week? Well, it's, if it's going to be this week, it's going to be in a matter of hours. Uh, and I hope that nothing happens. I hope we're all completely horribly disappointed. So Terrell and I can get our Chernobyl tour on, which we canceled twice already because we thought there was, there was going to be an invasion. Uh, but let's let's stipulate some things. First off, the Russians had when this crisis uh, really was at its peak, uh, 60 to 70 combat battalions, combat ready units. That has gone up to 110 as of today. They have 70% of the Russian army is around Ukraine right now. 70%. And they have over 500 combat aircraft within range of Ukraine uh, that can support these operations. If this is a strategic feint and he thinks that he's just going to lull us into sleep, you know, lull the Ukrainians into sleep, we have a lot of intelligence collection assets right now, which can tell us definitively when they're going to kick off. But the thing is, is that let's look at it for the, the strategic objectives of Putin. What was it he wanted? He wanted to get NATO offside. He wanted to uh, get the Europeans to split from the Americans. That's not happening. He's unified NATO. He, in fact, may make NATO go from 30 nations to 32 with the addition of Sweden and Finland. This is really a disaster for Putin. But whatever's going on, as, as Ann Applebaum says, don't think of it rationally the way Americans think of it. Think of it in Putin terms. And that means irrationally according to whatever's happening inside his head. If anything happens, and God forbid that it does, and H hour is tonight, well, you know, right now it's, it's uh, 5.30, in the evening, by nine o'clock, they should hit this country with a cyber attack that should blind it. And then by midnight, we're going to have ballistic missiles raining down from all over East, Western Russia, all over Ukraine. And then the airstrikes are going to come. Uh, and in, at that point, you'll be in the largest war in Europe since World War II. Uh, and it's going to be brutal and it will de devastate this country. Now, I'm hoping I'm getting up early in the morning and nothing happens and we can all go 
and reschedule our Chernobyl tour. But I have to assume that a man that has put virtually the entirety of the Russian armed forces on his border has distributed ammunition, which is a key indicator that that's a war indicator. You can't be fooled by him saying we're withdrawing some units. Yeah, those units may be unnecessary for the offensive, and he can say that. But, you know, or he maybe they don't do anything. He starts withdrawing as of this weekend, and we can verify that. And he will explain to the Russian people that he got something from us. We're on Putin's time, Putin's dime, and Putin's mindset. And none of it can be trusted. So there was a piece. Um, a number of Ukrainian security experts have been sharing their analysis of the likelihood of war. Their read on the situation is that Russia doesn't have in place what's needed for a sustained occupation. Do you think that's correct? I, I actually went to the Donbass battlefront last week, and we were briefed by um, General uh, Shervsky, who, who is the commanding general of all land forces in Ukraine, as well as the battle. Com- there's another battle commander there who's responsible for Donbass, Luhansk, and Crimea. By his estimation, the Russians didn't have the resources in place to carry out a blitz. But that may have changed in the last week. With regards to the occupation, we've seen an intense amount of of Rosgardia forces, which are the Russian National Guard, and they would be the occupation forces. Uh, And there may be as many as 20 or 30,000 of them. But let's make no mistake, this country's huge. They're going to need another 100,000 troops to take everything west of Kiev. I mean, and it's going to take them weeks to get past the uh, Dnieper River. Uh, this is going to be, if they attack, there's not going to be any folding like in Crimea. It's going to be a bloodbath. And it will ruin this country. It will turn it, you know, this country has been rebuilt since 1945. And they're talking about destroying it all because the only way to fight here is going to be total war. But so Kiev is the Jerusalem of the Slavs. They're ancient, ancient historic sites that Ukraine claims as heritage, that so does Russia and Belarus. Do you think Putin is mad enough, like Hitler wanted to level Paris to the ground? Do you think Putin is mad enough to destroy the Jerusalem of the Slavs? Well, I'll, I'll answer that. So the, the answer is yes, because the bottom line of it is that this is this whole concept of Putin, you know, honoring, you know, the Kiev roots, right? You know, like Ukraine being the mother city of Russia is a mirage, right? And we need to make this clear. Putin is a racist. And the reason why I'm saying that it's a racist, it, 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 and I know that this sounds foreign to a lot of people who are who are Russia or watchers per se, and we don't look at things through the lens of race. Putin hates Ukrainians. There is no particular or polite way to say that. The way that he describes them, the way that he uses a historical analysis about Ukrainians, it's very very similar to how white Americans during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s talked about Black people. Our people are fine down here, and you Northers coming down to tell us about how to run our country. You're leaving, you know, you're 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 trying to manipulate and radicalize our good Negroes. This is the way that Putin thinks about the Ukrainians. It is the exact same copy. He despises them, he hates them, and he's taking a playbook from Stalin. He can't starve them to death. So what he does is that he manipulates Ukrainians and he uses them and he manipulates them, he menaces them with his military. Since I cannot deprive you of food, I'm going to abuse you. And this is what a batterer does. You know, he is not a reformed person who really, you know, who, who has an invested interest in preserving Ukrainian culture. And so that's so that's why all these military deployments that Malcolm brilliantly outlined make sense. This is not an attempt to preserve Ukrainian culture. It is to destroy it and to recreate it in a form of Russia, of a Russian narrative. And so I absolutely believe that he will destroy everything down here because he doesn't give a damn. That has all there's, there's the premise of Putin's ideology towards this country has never been about preserving Ukrainian culture. It's about integrating geography back into Russia so that it is a whole black of this country as opposed to a sovereign nation. They have never viewed Ukraine as, indiv- as an individual country that is deserving of sovereignty, that is deserving of agency because he does not 
perceive them as complete human beings. So my answer is an emphatic yes. He will destroy this in order to make a point because he can't. And it's not going, and it's going to translate in the same, and it's going to translate to the Russian people that as long as we have the land, you know, destruction of it be damned. This will be a resurrection of Catherine the Great. I mean, that when you look, think about the conquest mentality, you know, you, you kept, much of Ukraine came under Catherine the Great. And so if he can resurrect that type of image, whether or not he has the gravitas of a Catherine the Great is irrelevant. The fact that he can manipulate the narrative so that he does is what he wants. So I want to ask you both about timing. Why now? And to set up that question, I want to point out to our listeners that Zelensky, the current president, came to power with an overwhelming vote, right? He had like something like, like a massive amount of the people voted for him. And part of his political platform was that he was going to try to wind down the war with Russia. So he came in as a dove. Even his big oligarch backer, Kolomoisky, was, was making Russian-friendly comments to the press. And for the first year or so, Zelensky was chill with Russia to the point where he got a lot of criticism and accusations of being a traitor. And then, you know, as the saying goes, revolutions are easy, governing is harder. Zelensky's revolution turned into governing and with it sinking poll numbers. And he started going after his critics. Um, he went after his big campaign rival, Poroshenko, who's staunchly pro-Ukrainian. And that was seen as like banana republic type stuff. And he got a lot of criticism for that. But then he also went after his critics on the Kremlin side, like Putin's dark prince in Ukraine, Medvedchuk. And Medvedchuk's child has Putin as a godfather. They're, they're brothers. And, Med, and he shuts down Medvedchuk's media empire. He puts Medvedchuk on house arrest. And then just recently, he shuts down the, uh, another Kremlin TV network owned by another Putin puppet inside Ukraine, who British intelligence warned that Putin was going to uh, replace uh, Zelensky. So Zelensky has cleaned house Michael Corleone style in the Godfather baptism scene when it comes to Putin's puppets in Ukraine and their, their propaganda machines, their, their, their t- TV networks, right? Um, their Fox Newses. And it seems like that has been a driving force of this because Putin no longer has his tentacles inside Ukraine. He no longer has his puppet strings in Ukraine. And on top of that, you have Biden coming to power, who's calling Kremlin aggression a national emergency. And he wants to avoid any accountability or punishment from Biden. So now he's being scarier than ever. And then, so I want to just ask you both, like, what is your sense of why now? Why didn't he grab Ukraine when he could under Trump? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll address that. So let me get back to Zelensky. Zelensky is a very complex figure, and everyone describes him as a comedian and and somebody who's a jokester, per se. And so, you know, when you think about Poroshenko, that's another complex issue. So the thing about Poroshenko, the reason why Zelensky won, and and I'm going to give you my, I'm going to give you my view, and then I'm going to give you Ukrainian view. I think Poroshenko, I think that, he has not been given enough credit for maintaining and preserving the sovereignty of this country. The fact that Ukraine exists as a sovereign nation to this day is a miracle. Let's just put it all on the table and just be clear about that. And we have Poroshenko to thank in part for that, because one thing that you'll hear in Washington is that Poroshenko was a great diplomat. He speaks, listen, his English is as good as mine or yours. He understands communications. He understands systems. He understands how to manage And so, yes, is he an oligarch? Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm not putting that aside at all. But the fact that he was able to manage this country since 2014, and inevitably he lost, um, the fact that Zelensky has the country in the shape that it is, is a tribute to Poroshenko's diplomacy. That is just an inobjective fact, okay? And even the most skeptical Ukrainian, if they understand what's going on, they would acknowledge that. Right, even if they don't particularly like Poroshenko's politics and his oligarchy, he was, and, and the reason why he was swept out of power is precisely because he did very, you know, he didn't do a lot to reform the judiciary, right? And so the irony here's another thing, irony, and I'm going to get a slightly into the weeds because this is an important context to your question. Poroshenko is complaining about the judiciary right now, but the same the judiciary that he refused to reform is the one that is judging him. Okay, so so <laughs> so that's the irony of all of this, right? And so that's the critique about him. And so now when you think about 
all these levers about, you know, Biden. Biden was the point was during Obama's second term, you know, and, and you'll get this from my interview with Michael McFaul. Obama was the Russia person that dealt directly with Putin, and Biden was the person who was the pinpoint individual for Ukraine. He was the one that came to Ukraine and pretty much admonished lawmakers about the fact that they needed to come, you know, come down hard on corruption. He was like that old dad that came down here and just kind of shaking his hand at the Ukrainian parliament, chastising them about their need to address corruption. And so it, it would be appropriate that he would be handling this Kremlin made priceless as he did. He gets an A plus for the manner in which he's handling it. And so when you think about why Trump, going back to your next part, why he did not, why Putin did not take Ukraine while Putin was in power, the reason is because of Poroshenko, the, the, the Ukrainian military is not the same Ukrainian military that existed in 2014. In 2014, the Ukrainian military didn't exist. And you'll have high-ranking Ukrainian military officials who will tell you that. This is the most combat really military in all of Europe. It is not the most technically advanced, but it's the most combat ready. These people have fought since 2018. And the reason why Putin didn't come in and take because he would have to come in for a fight. These people are not wealthy, are not, are not going to be waiting for Putin's troops with milk and cookies. Um, Malcolm Nance, and I'll give for Malcolm about this. Um, Malcolm Nance literally said this will be the white Taliban. You know, I'm here in Western Ukraine. If you if you are here, you would appreciate the system about what is happening. And I equate it to near hatred. And I came here in 2009 as a Fulbright and the, and the difference in tempo and tenor about Russia, and I'm not talking about the everyday Russian citizen, but just talking about the cultural philosophy and approach towards Ukraine, it borders hatred and you feel it. And so did, did any, uh, any, any assault that will come here will be met with extreme force that you would, that you would make it uh, akin to you know, what Malcolm would describe again as a white Taliban, as, 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 as a way that the Afghans created America back in the 1980s and in 2000 when they invaded. It, it, it will be extraordinarily fierce. You will see violence. You know, these very, you know, these, these, these people that are walking down the street, they will pick up guns and they will fight. And I know that because I've spoken to them myself. Yeah, let me second that. Uh, this, you know, I've now been out with the Ukrainian army. I've watched them on the field. I've seen their professionalism. and. Like Terrell said, 2014, they were taken by surprise by the Russians because they thought these were sort of, you know, their brothers uh, or bigger brothers or something like that. They had no idea their their mean spiritedness. And now they've got a full measure of that mean spiritedness. They've lost 14,000 people dead since 2014. And they put the pictures of all the soldiers who were killed on the walls of St. Michael's Cathedral every time someone's killed. The word that I would use here is that they will fight the Russians out of pure, unadulterated spite. They will just blitz them with whatever they have. So I hear these people saying that they, they're going to, you know, that the Russians themselves would, would be able to technologically overwhelm the Ukrainians. Well, that may be true, but there's a factor of, of being able to beat your enemy through sheer willpower. And when I made that comment about the white Taliban, I was talking about the post-war. If Russia comes in, takes 20, 30,000 dead, wipes out Ukraine, there's, there's no occupying this whole country. It's massive. But you know what? Uh, when Terrell and I went to the uh, Rodina Mat, the uh, giant statue from World War II, you know, the motherland statue... I, you know, you walk through this hall of all of the, the entities that contributed to the war. And the one that the Russians apparently forgot about was this giant, twice as life size series of people who represented the partisans that fought the, the Nazis underground, blew up IEDs, you know, sniped Nazi troops and helped, you know, undermine their rule. Well, that's what the Ukrainians will do. These soldiers aren't going to roll over. They're not going to surrender. Uh, they're going to fight and evade and, and move to the West until they can get to the point where American weapons or German weapons are, will, 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 right. Yeah, Terrell's putting that picture up now, uh, where those weapons will, will start coming into play. And let me tell you, when I, um, I did an interview with um, Ukrainian Army television because, you know, I'm, I'm an old soldier. You know, I said, 
the question that I think the journalists are not asking you correctly is, how many stingers do you need? How many Javelin, any tank missiles do you need? Because I think that the Biden administration, if they actually do invade, if he's going to talk to, to Putin today, I would say, listen, I see your forces. You've moved your ammunition. You are in assault force position. You are ready to go. No go at any minute. If you do that, I'm going to drop 10,000 Javelin missiles into Ukraine. There will be five for every soldier. And that means that you can come into that country. But, you know, Malcolm, every you one of your tanks will be needs. destroyed. Malcolm, explain yeah. what a Javelin needs. They don't yeah, a, a Javelin is an American. Explain what a Javelin is in a, sting- yeah. in a stinger. Yeah, a Javelin is an American anti-tank missile that is absolutely top of the line of our technology. You aim it, uh, you, you know, once it locks on to what you've aimed at, you pull the trigger and then you get up and leave. The missile does all of the work. It, it will guide itself to the target. It can't be really defeated and it has enough capability to blow through anything the Russians have. And so we've already sent several, uh, you know, a couple of thousand of those to them. In fact, Donald Trump got impeached because he tried to extort Zelensky to do um, the uh, Joe Biden corruption fraud by saying, we're not going to give you those Javelin missiles, which Zelensky knows is critical to the defense of the nation. And as of today, we all see that they were absolutely critical to keeping this country alive. If those missiles weren't there, they probably would have invaded already. But, you know, Russia's doing calculations that they may be able to defeat that before a lot of these weapon systems can get to the field. I'd make it clear that, again, if I was Biden, oh, I'm going to equip whatever remains of the U- Ukrainian army with more javelins than you can shake a stick at. And by the time they're finished, you won't own a tank. You know, they will literally chop their way through there. Also, the same with Stinger missiles. That's a surface-to-air missile which can shoot down Russian helicopters and low-flying jets, just like the Taliban, you know, like... Uh, like we used in Afghanistan. If you do those things, then Putin has to understand, you know, videotape of long burning columns of Russian tanks will not endear him to the families of his now volunteer armed force in Russia. As Gaslit Nation listeners know, there's a lot going on that makes us want to throw up. The plague, the coup, the wars, the steady assault on democracy. Well, for once, I've got good news. You can check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and more. Relief Band stimulates a nerve in the wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea and blocks the signal your brain is sending to your stomach telling you that you are sick. It is 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, and provides all-natural, long-lasting relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. I'm wearing my Relief Band now, and I can tell you it's already easing my existential dread. Thank you, Relief Band. Relief Band makes a great gift for any time of year. Right now, they've got an exclusive offer just for Gaslit Nation listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use promo code GASLIT, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. That's the best offer you'll find for Relief Band anywhere, but you have to use my code. So head to R E L I E F B A N D.com and use our promo code GASLIT for 20% off plus free shipping. Friends in the Russian opposition have said to me that if Putin invades Ukraine, it's the end of his regime. It seems that on some level, Putin must realize the massive risk. And if you look at Russia's recent, in recent history, Russia's military excursions, they've been picking off low hanging fruit in Moldova, Georgia, Crimea, the eastern tip of Ukraine. Even what they did, the atrocities they committed in Syria and propping up Assad. They were doing that under the guise of fighting ISIS with the West. They took advantage of a critical situation there. But for the most part, it's been low-hanging fruit. It's been wars that they feel pretty confident they can win. Ukraine is not that. How is that all factoring right now into Putin's calculations? Well, let me just do a little bit of that about Putin's mindset. Uh, When I wrote my last book, The Plot to Betray America, I went to his office 
in Dresden when he was a junior KGB officer, where he did most of his human intelligence activity of flipping people as spies. That guy loves the manipulation game. And he now is seeing that he can do this on a geopolitical level. Uh, what would make him think he could take this place? I think he has a very Soviet mindset, almost a Stalinistic mindset towards the countries that he attacks. Terrell was in Georgia. He'll tell you about that. I've seen what they've done in Syria. The first thing they did in Syria was they bombed every hospital in all of northern Syria, killed the doctors, killed the patients. Then the Russian Air Force started destroying every ambulance that was in Syria and White Hats rescuers firehouses. That's the total war mentality that he has. I think if he comes here, if this thing kicks off tonight, this is going to get brutal. And I've made that joke that the Ukrainians will turn Kiev into the largest Molotov cocktail party in, since Stalingrad. That's not a joke because they're going to have to use that level of force to subjugate the place. Is Putin the man to do that? I think maybe in his mind, since his dad was Stalin's cook, maybe he thinks he's, you know, he's going to be the roughest, toughest guy since Ivan the Terrible. Wow. Okay. So um, do you think he would even go as far as West Ukraine, where you are? He can try. I don't think he'll get west of Kiev. He can surround Kiev, for example. He can't take it. I've been all around that city. I have been in combat. I've been in land warfare all around the world. I've been to, I've been to Sarajevo in wartime. And they surrounded that city and couldn't take it. I mean, this is not something you can do. I mean, a Molotov cocktail thrown by an 85-year-old grandmother out a window is just as effective as a Molotov cocktail thrown by a 15-year-old kid, right? They have to factor in that not only are they going to be with a hostile population, they're going to be with a hostile population that will, will shoot at them from behind every rock and tree. Can they get west of, like, Jidomir, west, which is about 100 kilometers west of Kiev? I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, whoever the remaining Ukrainian army units that fall back will have a logistic and resupply tail that's going to be coming from NATO. And I'm not joking about, you know, making stingers fall off a truck at the Polish border, you know, by the hundreds and hundreds. I'm certain that that's what we'll do. We'll empty U.S. Army stocks in Europe and give the army a fighting chance. At that point, with, stick, with, um, with Javelin missiles, they can counterattack. And literally, you know, Russian tanks, here's something about occupying countries, all right? I know it, since I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. You got to sit those tanks at the crossroads, and you got to defend all these crossroads and military installations you seized, which means you're now a static target, and you are javelin bait. Another thing is, this place is like an IED festival, improvised explosive device. In Afghanistan, we had giant swaths of open land. Every field in this country is surrounded by trees. And granted, they can come, you know, tanks are going to come out into those giant empty fields, but the ambushes are coming from the trees, the culverts, the roads, the bridges, the houses, the schools, the churches. You know, this, you got to go back to 1945 to talk about how to fight in this country. And it, it will not be pretty for the Russians. Out of all the former Soviet republics, and I know we want to decolonize the language about how we describe Ukraine and the rest of the of, of countries that were colonized by this empire, but I'm using it just for important context. Of all of the countries that were part of the USSR, Ukraine has a very rich partisan tradition. And so when, you know, 1917, everyone presumed that everybody just fell in line. That's not necessarily the case with Ukraine. You know, you had partisan armies that existed. And that culture is not, you know, that many generations of way. And so when you, you ask the question about going into Western Ukraine, if you think that Eastern Ukraine would be difficult here, would be a whole different story. So this whole metaphor about the white Taliban what really manifests itself in Western Ukraine because we focus on much other on the East. This is a vastly different culture than Eastern Ukraine in that when you think about the independence, when you think about the Stepan Bandera type of tradition, which is a, he's a very complex figure, that's a whole other podcast. But when you think about the resistance culture here, it is a thousand times more pronounced here 
than it is in eastern Ukraine. And that has nothing to do with me saying that, that you know, the eastern part, you know, is, is any less than western U- Ukraine. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just speaking truly about facts and thinking about the cultural dynamics that would be interact that that would be faced here if you come into the West. It is a vastly different culture. So when you think about, you know, we're in in Lviv right now. This is by many people considered to be the cultural jewel of the country. Yes, Kiev is the capital, but Lviv is the cultural considered to be like the cultural capital of this country or the mothership of the country. And so, Kiev. So I always want to point out, Kiev would disagree with you. <laughs> Uh, no, listen, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to distinguish. think. Yes, I, I get it. But what I'm, I'm just giving you purely from a military standpoint that the partisan aspect of it that would evoke a particular type of reaction that would give you a dip, that, that would give you a very unique type of uprising that we haven't seen in Europe since World War II. So no, this again, like I said before, this part of the country especially is not going to greet any Russian military with milk and cookies, you know. Let me make one comment about the West now that I've been in the Carpathian Mountains. No one's taken that place, right? I mean, the entire country would have to roll over and surrender, right? And no one, it would take them months to get out, you know, through combat just to get out to the Carpathian Mountains. I don't think that's even viable. But you know what? The Russians will get introduced to some concepts that the Americans learned the hard way the uh, explosively formed projectile IED, which is improvised explosive device, which is a cop- it's a simple copper disc inside a piece of black iron pipe with explosives behind it. And uh, when you detonate it, it turns that copper disc into a molten glob of, I- of copper lava. It will cut through anything in the Russian inventory. And you know what? Guys were making these things in their basements. So, you know, I know out here in Lviv, this is where they build tanks, uh, you know, and we, you know, we saw some drones, you know, some robots here recently. This place will become the most innovative IED, you know, assembly uh, region in the world. They will blow the Taliban and the ISIS and the Iraqi insurgents records off the charts. The Russians won't be able to get near a horse cart without wondering whether it's going to blow up on them. Why would he do this? He, he must have a, a, a total war mindset for him to even consider this. Or he's, he's giving the biggest fake, you know, in history. The white Taliban, imagine every person in this country now is the enemy, is hunting you. Every person, right? Kids are going out to school and they're dropping, uh, you know, they're laying the wire for IEDs. <laughs> OK, we only saw three horse carts, you know, with hay on them the entire time we were here. So I'm very disappointed. But imagine, you know, cars coming down the roads to your checkpoints that are not cars, but in fact, you know, robotic vehicle born IEDs. They're not suicide bombers. They're robot bombers with two or three thousand pounds of explosives ramming your checkpoint and blowing up. These guys will be tri- it will be an order of magnitude worse than the Taliban. The Taliban did it through drip, drip, drip. This will be a daily slaughter for the Russians. And Malcolm, let me add in something too. Uh, I want to tell you, Andrea. So, so, so here's, here's the issue is that one of the things that you don't see on Western media and what me and, me and Malcolm see over here because we're here, and particularly me, because you know I'm, I'm constantly in the know of what's happening here in Ukraine, is that, you know, and, and I'm going to take words from Malcolm, People, you know, in the Western media, you would assume that there is no army here. Like I said before, this is the most combat ready army in all of Europe. It is not the most technologically sound, but it is the most combat ready. So basically, there is, and I think people, because it's Ukraine, and we, you know, we talk about white Taliban, there is a bias that, you know, this type of kind of, um, of civilian participation in warfare is germane to the Middle East. And so there's a little bit of stereotyping in that as well, but it has nothing to do with your nationality or culture. It has everything to do with the fact that you're not going to let your country go, right? And that is regardless, and that has nothing to do with race or ethnicity or religion. That has everything to do with the will of your people. And you can see video of you know, adults training nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds how to use a gun, 
And if you're not paying attention to Ukrainian social media and TikTok, you're not going to know that. But I pay attention. These people are training the youngest person who's a pick up on weapons to fight. It is really, really severe. I don't think people are prepared for the type of resistance that's going to happen here. Again, you know, Andre, like I'm here half the year. I don't think people appreciate the disdain about how they've been treated. It is severe. And and, and, and we bring up the white Taliban that punctuates the fact that this the, the type of resistance that the average person here, I don't care if they're five years, I don't care if they're nine years old, I don't care if they're 80 years old. They're going to fight and there's never going to be a psychological defeat of this country. And if you don't have a psychological defeat and breakdown, they're not going to win the war. They will win battles, but they will not win a war. Let me um, jump in there real quick and let me help the U.S. media here, because the reason I brought up the phrase white Taliban was to give them the impression of of what's to come. But, you know, we don't we haven't seen a resistance organization in Europe since, you know, uh, the Hungarian Revolution. So let me help the U.S. media. The Ukrainian Maquis, right? Ukrainian freedom fighters and partisans are what's going to crop up here. And you're going to have feisty mountain men and young students who took part in Maidan all out to defeat the Russian occup- occupation force. Um, and until that you know, magnificent image pops into the news media's head, uh, again, they act like there's not even a Ukrainian army. There's 250,000 men and women in, in this armed forces. Granted, they're not technologically as advanced as Russia, but you don't need, you know, as ISIS has taught us, as Al Qaeda has taught us, as Al Shabaab terrorists in Somalia have taught us, you don't have to be technologically savvy to defeat an advanced force. You just have to be committed to kicking their butts. I just want to make a, a quick point on what you said. No child anywhere should be taught how to use a gun to defend themselves. The fact that it's come to that in Ukraine, which I understand perfectly, is part of Putin's war crimes against humanity. That's a whole level of cruelty that you're putting children through that. Um, the other point I wanted to, em- uh, to make, I wanted to, the other point I wanted to make to emphasize your points is that Ukraine leads the world in IT talent. There are several cities across Ukraine that compete with each other to be the Silicon Valley of Ukraine. And you and so all of that ingenuity certainly is something that would go into a ground resistance game. So so that that's so all of that, of course, is is fascinating to hear and also heartbreaking and unnerving. We 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 saw some of that. We saw some of that with we visited a robotics engineering company here. And, you know, they were producing things to be, you know, to evacuate soldiers from the battlefield. But they could just as easily be turned into suicide bomb drones or remote weapons platforms that are sniper platforms that, you know, can start picking off Russian soldiers one at a time. And when the Russians get there, there's nothing there but a remote, you know, robot that's used a um, that's used a joystick from a, a DJI drone or just using drones to drop small improvised explosive devices like ISIS pioneered. This is insanity because it it will excite the technological know-how of these people in places like ivano Frankich and, and Lviv, where there are these, what do they call it? I think the word's Garan or something. These little IT startups. You just don't want that to be started up for war because the Russians will pay for it in blood. If... Ukraine does fall or or if Ukraine becomes a much larger frozen conflict and Putin has Ukraine where he wants it in in a matter of time. Do you think eventually, since Putin has engineered it, that he can now die in power like any dictator? Do you think Putin will eventually go on to doing this to Lithuania or Poland? Do you think he'll attack NATO next? Because part of his demands are he wanted NATO troops out of Eastern Europe. That is not going to happen. Don't forget, you attack Estonia, Lithuania, or or Latvia, you are attacking all 30 NATO nations, which means the Third World War starts, okay? Which means every piece of American, European firepower comes online. It will be massive air battles over the Belarus plain. Uh, We'll lose people left and right. But you know what it will do? It will. We will assemble a ground war and we will 
chew the Russian army to pieces. I got some news for you. They only have one arm, okay? They got a lot of tanks, but, you know, back in the oldie days, when there was the Warsaw Pact, which was Russia and its, its version of NATO, of its slave states here, they had some crazy number, like 40,000 tanks. Well, today, the Russian army only has 2,500 tanks. NATO has three to one superiority on that. OK, and that means that we're going to have to ruin Russia. We're going to have to de- de- bring them down to where they don't exist. The only thing that they'll have less left to deter anything is their nuclear weapons stock. Up. Nobody wants this. OK, nobody wants this kind of war. And I hope that Putin is if he's losing his mind, maybe his generals need to resolve that issue. Yeah, and, and Malcolm, I'll also add that it's not just a military standpoint, it's economic. It's economic. And so Putin would be put off from every economic organization in the world, and they don't want that. And so he, it, you know, and, and now and, and keep in mind that if Putin is put off from every financial institution, every bank, they're going to have to go to China. And the way I describe it is that China's looking at all of this with the bird man, with the bird man hand, you know, hand rub, because at the end of the day, they're scavengers, right? That, you know, Beijing is scavengers as it, as it pertains to Putin, because all they're going to do is, 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 is uh, Kremlin's going to go and, and all their oil are going to go to China with interest rates that's going to be three times or even more the interest rate, right? And the Chinese don't necessarily trust Russia anyway, because they're like a diversification in their economy, because it's, it's, it's a talking about vk the russian facebook the founder yes, fled yes, russia mm-hmm. yeah he fled russia yeah that's that yeah thank you uh thank you very much for that so so the issue is that if the russian government comes to you and say hey we need to get your data so we can kind of find these so we can find these people who are organizing campaigns on your platform and you say no right one you're killing ingenuity right because ingenuity requires that has to be independent of government control because in a free market enterprise you get the best out of people when they don't have to be slaves to government rule. And so in the case of Durov, he was forced out of the country, right? So that's number two. Now, if you are a opposition leader like Boris Nepsev, right, you know, um, you know, in the case where you're killed in front of the Kremlin, those are three things, right? And so you can't tolerate opposition. So if you don't, so if you can't tolerate opposition, you have to kill it. So one, you're forced out of the country, you're forced into prison, or you are killed. That is the fate of a smart Russian person. And it's very clear to me that the co-founder of Google is not in Russia. He is in the United States of America. So that's something that's important context that you have to keep in mind. And so you're not also from a so Malcolm is correct on a military standpoint, but it's an economic dynamic that plays into it. And so 
when you think about the sanctions regime, which where I think that you really have to put pressure on them through a sanction standpoint, because you have to really ask the Russian people is all of this worth it. And if they and, and if they choose to be enslaved to this mentality that America is the enemy as opposed to looking at the Kremlin, then and that's a question for them to answer. So it goes beyond a military consequence and it goes into this notion that if you attack NATO, you're just completely knocked off the market. And I don't think that's something that the Russian elite at the bare minimum can stand. Putin recently had this unhinged performance where he threatened nuclear war against the West, saying something to the effect of, if you come after me or you try to get Crimea back, I will nuke you and there'll be no winners. And so do you think he would cross that line? If Ukraine puts up this fierce resistance, should he escalate his invasion? Do you think Putin would go nuclear on Ukraine? No, and I don't think anyone, I mean, if he is really seriously discussing that, with his battle staff, they should seriously be discussing about resolving and terminating his rule. Because, look, I worked at the National Nuclear Command Post for a little while. That's those underground bunker, you know, posts dug into mountains. Let me tell you something. Everyone who goes in comes out an ardent anti-nuke. Those things are not effing toys. They cannot be used. You nuke something, you blow it up, the dust goes around the world and gets in your milk by the next morning. Talking about using nuclear weapons is is not the sign of a person of any stability whatsoever. Because, I mean, he knows the viability of it. He's just using these excited phrases uh, in order to show just how far he will go. Well, you know, Ukraine has something to say about that. Uh, You know, if I had my way, Maybe Ukraine's nuclear weapons that they gave up need to be restored to them. Now, that sounds like a crazy statement, right? But we found out that the weapons that they gave up, that they couldn't really operate anyway, are were the only thing keeping Russia at bay. And the lesson to the rest of the world is never give up your nukes because a country like Russia will come after you. But no one should be talking about the N-word, okay, because it's dangerous, it's insane, it affects every human on this planet. And so if he's doing that, you better chalk that stuff up to rhetoric. But again, if he's seriously putting that into his battle plan, then anyone who has children or, or wants a future needs to be thinking about how to get that guy out of office. I wanted to ask you about the Biden administration's response to the crisis. As we all watched last year with Afghanistan, and the humanitarian disaster there with what many critics are calling a rushed pullout. There is now sort of chatter that the reason why Biden's team is pulling everyone out of Ukraine and essentially causing a mass panic of all these other countries pulling their people out is because they don't want to repeat Afghanistan. So they're acting from an abundance of caution. Um, And Ukrainians are then suffering all this economic fallout. Their flights are being canceled and their economy is taking a hit. And what the accusation has been out of Ukraine by many journalists and and people there is that Ukrainians feel as though they've been sanctioned because of Russia's aggression against them, and that Putin's whole troop buildup is really benefiting through this economic warfare against Ukraine. So why do you think Biden acted in that way? Was it the right thing to do And what more should Biden and the West generally do to give Ukraine what it needs to succeed against Russia? Look, let me answer this. First off, Afghanistan was going to happen that way no matter what. Okay, we didn't just jump up and leave. They sold the country to the Taliban when Donald Trump signed a secret agreement with them and didn't even tell the government of Afghanistan. So no matter what happened, Afghanistan was going the way it was. The non-combatant evacuation operation, and I've taken part in four major NEOs, as we call them, um, was as good as it was going to get. Uh, Yes, we took some casualties, but, you know, it it was a horrific situation. This is an order of magnitude bigger. Um, I mean, a real order of magnitude bigger here. You're talking literally open major land warfare with the most sophisticated weapons on this planet, minus atomic bombs being waged against a country of 42 million people. 
Okay, we're not talking about just you know suicide bombers at an airport. We're talking about thermobaric, you know, um, white phosphorus laden rockets falling in civilian neighborhoods and burning the populations to death. Those I just saw videos of those rocket launchers just this morning along the Ukrainian border. So let's put the terms in the, the way they need to be. This is, you know, this is literally World War II level combat that will occur here in this country. Uh, Biden has to hit the numbers. And all this bull about, oh, he's trying, you know, he's causing a panic. He's seeing intelligence that the rest of us aren't. And I see the fringes of it. And until just two days ago, I was very optimistic that the Russians weren't out of their minds. But now I'm seeing. I'm seeing the intelligence that oh, two weeks ago the White House would have had, which is ammunition moving, logistics moving, things that are needed to sustain combat and forces moving into their forward um, command posts and assault positions. That's happening. And look, I'm hoping, let's pray to God that you don't wake up tomorrow morning or around five or six in the evening uh, Eastern Standard Time that we are not at a full scale war with Iskander ballistic missiles, Bastion and caliber cruise missiles blowing up all over Ukraine, including here in Lviv, because they have military facilities out here. There's MiG bases out in the West. Um, I'm, I mean, you know, this is why Terrell gets so frustrated with the anti-war left, okay? The people who are waging war here is Russia. We are responding because we have an alliance of 30 nations that, you know, what? how many countries border this that are NATO? Four. Poland, Slovakia, Romania, uh, and Hungary all border this nation. Uh, they are literally on the edge if the Russians, what if Russian cruise missiles fly into Poland and kill Polish citizens? You know, this isn't a game. And people who are saying, oh, what do you think Biden's doing this? Combat does not care. Combat will kill whoever is in its way. Man, woman, and child. I have fought four, well, three major wars and several small wars. And this is as serious as it comes. Let's hope it all just goes away. So, uh, you know, we can go on our Chernobyl tour. What if there, God willing, is no war? How long can Putin keep his troops amassed at this level in order to uh, keep these tensions high, further economically weaken Ukraine? How long can Putin uh, sustain this? I, I'll, I'll take that one, Malcolm. So, so the thing about it is that Putin is not accountable to anyone. So, for example, if America were to do the same thing, there would be hearings in Congress. There would be nonstop TV coverage of this. There would be mothers on television, be it local, re, you know, state level, national level, um, raising alarm and, 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 and raising holy hell about why he's doing this. And Biden would have no choice but to respond to that. Because, you know, one of the things that I want your listeners to understand is that Putin does not have that same uh, accountability. He has no accountability. You know, it is an autocratic, kleptocratic state in Russia, which means that it is supreme one-party rule, and it's autocratic, and it, you know, and I don't call it a straight-up dictatorship, because North Korea is a straight-up dictatorship. It is an autocratic state. And, and so it could, it could continue ongoing, because one thing that we all need to know is that even, you know, if we were to believe that these reports of you know, from, from, from the defense ministry of Russia that troops are slowly withdrawing and going back to base. Keep in mind that this is a tactic that was used before. And so to really address your question, this can go on for an entire year because he has the political capacity and the lack of accountability to his own populace. And in some sense, you can make the argument that a, a strong a number of his populace are okay with this. Let's just be real. If you look at recent polling, you will see that a vast majority of Russians agree with the annexation of Crimea, right? And so there is a colonial framework that is embedded in much of the Russian population. And so if you have those two coming together, this operation of going back and forth controlling Ukraine with this military can be nonstop because he has no accountability in the What 
do you want to see from Biden and the West to make sure that Ukraine has everything it needs to succeed should Russia go all in? Yeah, I, I'll tell you right now, if I were Joe Biden today, it's what I said early, and I'm on my last call with Vladimir Putin, and I've got NSA and uh, reconnaissance intelligence saying that they are absolutely in position, tanks are moving, communicating with each other, battle orders have been sent, each hour has been set for 0300, I'd say, quite simply, the minute you cross that border, I am going to airlift in 5,000 javelins. Your army, in about a week, are going to start getting devastated, all right? And you think that we shouldn't participate in this? You're about to kill tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of civilians here. So maybe we need to level the playing field. Uh, I know Ukrainian army has for 12,000 West German anti-tank rockets. You know what? If I were the United States Army, I'd buy those rockets from the German and have them all fall off a truck at the Polish-Hungarian-Ukrainian border and make sure that Russia understands. They may get to the Dip Dnipro River, but that is where the Army, you know, Ukrainian Army can start flowing those weapons and really just devastating the Russians. And I'd make it clear to the Ukrainian Armed Forces, use all the javelins you can in the initial onslaught. Get film of the burning columns and let's let Russia see what they've actually wrought. What do you say to, so if, if we should get into that level of engagement where we continue to give defensive aid to Ukraine when it's being massively invaded, what do you say to the critics on the far left and the far right who are saying, get out of Ukraine, we shouldn't be in Ukraine, and trying to make this a big political liability for Biden, or, or just or, or, or genuinely want us not to be involved in any way, shape, or form with Ukraine. Why? Hey, what Malcolm, would you say to them? You know, Code Pink put out a tweet the other day saying they expected millions of people to be in the streets protesting the war. What war? There's no war between the United States and Russia. There is a war where Russia is on the offense and Ukraine is on defense. We would be providing them weapons to defend themselves, not to go out and blitz another country. Russia is using all of its weapons, are now poised in an offensive way in which they are going to come through and recreate the Nazi blitzkrieg in reverse and, uh, you know, kill again tens or hundreds of thousands of people. This is, look, the U.S. Isn't, isn't shooting anybody. We're pro merely providing the means for them to defend themselves. And so for, the, for a lot of people in the West who have joined forces with the, with the Trump right to just insult Biden, it's just about humiliating Joe Biden. They've literally become fifth columnists. They are literally pro-Putin now. If you can imagine that in any time in American history, that America coming to the aid of a def in defense of a democracy, that we would have an entire party in America with liberal allies saying that we should back, you know, should, we should get out of the way of the fascist KGB dictator. I swear to God, I could never imagine this moment. Terrell, I want to say that your brilliant piece for foreign policy on why progressives should care about Ukraine is one that I want to print out and mail to every single member of the progressive caucus in Congress who will have to vote on a sanctions package for Ukraine. So I wanted to ask you, Terrell, like there, we need these sanctions, right? Because it's the whole strategy of, of banks, not tanks. And Ukrainians have been making all the sacrifices and the Brits don't want to sacrifice by cleaning up their Russian oligarch addiction. The Germans don't want to, and the French don't want to sacrifice either in cleaning up their Russian oligarch addiction to all that dirty Russian money. So what is your message to progressives out there that are anti-sanctions and might vote against a sanctions package to finally hold Putin and his court of oligarchs accountable? Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that question. So first off, sanctions are not a science. And I think that there's a science component to it, but it's primarily an art. And you have to be very clear about what you want to accomplish. And so 
you know, even in my piece, I hedge slightly about particularly hitting banks because if people can't conduct money, you know, business in dollars, that would definitely hamper them. But think about the fact that you have airlines that are, you know, canceling insurance over to the point into Ukraine. Ukrainians are suffering for virtually doing nothing. Meanwhile, Russians can come and flow to the West if they get the proper paperwork without call, without any problems whatsoever. And so automatically Ukraine is being punished. And so I don't have a problem with sanctions on banks that do have some type of impact on the general population because there's a complicity in that. We have to be, we have to have very uncomfortable conversations about that, right? We have to have an uncomfortable conversation that, like I said, there's a large population of people who do support the annexation of Crimea and do support President Vladimir Putin, even though you have a lot of, um, you know, a, a suppressed liberal Russian population that does, in fact, um, you know, strike are, are, are against Putin's uh, barbarianism. And so, but the primary issue is, and I think that this is something that people like Bernie Sanders are considering, for example, um, despite my disagreements with him, is that there's, you know, there are considerations about a severe sanction regime against Putin's elite. You know, and, and the thing about it is that these types of sanctions have not really been pushed since 1991, in the, you know, because the, the sanctions regime that, that's against that exists against the Kremlin right now is the strongest since 1991, right, with Obama. And so that kind of pushes back against this notion that Obama was weak against the, the Kremlin. That's not necessarily true. And again, that's another conversation for another podcast because that has its own complexities to it. But the sanctions regime against the Kremlin needs to be extraordinarily severe. It needs to be one that hits them so hard that if you're a Russian oligarch, if you have children in America, they need to have their assets get back to Russia and go to Mother Russia. Since Mother Russia is a country that you love so much, go live there. And the reason why you're not living in Mother Russia is because you know it is you know that you know that it's a country that is not conducive for a healthy, equitable life. You know that. That's the reason why your ass is in America. If Mother Russia was so good, you wouldn't be there. And, and we, we need to have a very uncomfortable conversation and not be polite about this and come forward with that. Everyone needs to suffer. If you love your country that much, go live there. And, and American lawmakers need to be very direct and driving that message clear, whatever access that Putin has. And I'm no Malcolm told me about this in my one of my er, very early podcasts. Take it, seize it, you know, ha, ha, have American military forces come take everything because we can't. So, you know, you have, if you're dealing with a brutal person, you have to be brutal with them. And you don't need to use tanks in order to do, you don't need to use military in order to do it. Just take their money. Because here's the bottom line, and I'm going to close out with this. This, and you know, I am a, I'm an anti-imperialist. I am against anything that you know. I'm, I'm a person that draws back America. You know how I stand on this issue. But the one thing that a oligarch, somebody who really can't stand, is for you to mess with their money. And with America, we are an open society, despite all of our faults. And if you know, with Google, with Facebook, with all these social media platforms, there are plenty of people in Congress who don't necessarily like how they operate, but because we live in a free society, we're able to grow and develop our money despite all the inequities in it. That's something that you can't do in Russia. So go back to Russia and grow your and grow your economies there because you can no longer take advantage of the loopholes in our banking systems. You can no longer go to K Street. Because that's another thing again. It's not just Russia. It's, it's, it's the people who don't give a damn about our country. Who, 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 to me, if you are somebody that does business with Russia under their current framework, I think you're a traitor. I think you're somebody that needs to be equally taken to task. And you need to be put in the same level, you know, in a similar level as Snowden. You are financing a government and a group of rich oligarchs who are undermining the integrity of democracy, not only in America and across the world, and you all need to pay economically and severely. I agree. Last word. You want to hurt them? I come from the take they money school of politics. Seize their assets worldwide. Implement global Magnitsky Act. Let the Ukrainians file a lawsuit in New York for an injunction for $50 billion, $100 billion, and then let's just start seizing their assets worldwide. Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, 
an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Megan McNearney. Sean Rubin. Todd S. Pearlstein. Pat. Kenny Maine. John Schoenthaler. Frank Chiquette. Ellen McGirt. Joel Farron. Larry Gasson. Erica Moore. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor, Andrea Scalzo, Karen Heisler, Jordan Sanders, Anne Bertino, T.R. Dunstan, John Millett, David East, Stu, Shannon Nacy, Ada, or Ida, Chris Fellow, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Holcomb, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hattrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Yvonne Q, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Michael Wooldridge, Kramer, no Kramer, <laughs> Jason Benke, Joe Darcy, Ann Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Joel Newman, Trigve, Christine M., D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Brian Tajudin, Maureen Murphy, Michelle Dash, Abby Road. Jens Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, Alabama, ZW, Jason Bainbridge, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, P.A. Itzma, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Kim Mellon, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Eric Kaplan, and Tanya Chalupa, thank you all so much for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you.